ticklish business any way you look at it. Come on, we'll stick together. Ticklish Business, the podcast devoted to honoring and deconstructing the world of classic cinema. As always, I'm your host, Kristen Lopez. To honor our centennial star for August, Robert Walker, guest Drea Clark is going to join me to look at the home front in 1944's Since You Went Away. And he was wonderful. He was marvelous in the part. He really was. And we ran to ran into each other. Uh, oh, several weeks after the movie had come out. And he was very glad to see me. And he said, let's get together. And I said, I'd love to. Okay, let's do it. And he said, all right, I'll call you. And then like a, a week later, he died. And uh, I was very sad because he was a wonderful, wonderful actor. And I respected him highly. The voice you just heard was Farley Granger, talking about our centennial celebrant Robert Walker. Robert Walker was born October 13, 1918 in Salt Lake City, Utah. When he was a child, his parents divorced, the first bit of emotional damage that he'd carry with him throughout his life. As a kid, he was a troublemaker, acting out, probably due to the divorce, and was expelled from several schools. Desperate for an outlet to fill the void, Walker took up acting, a pastime that was fostered by his aunt, Hortense Odlum. Good Aunt Hortense decided to financially support her nephew's hobby, paying to send him to the Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York City, where he'd go starting in 1937. It was while attending the ADA that he met the woman who became inextricably linked to his life, Phyllis Isley. Isley was a native of Tulsa, Oklahoma, raised in a staunch Roman Catholic household. She transferred to the Academy of Dramatic Arts in 1938 after previously attending Northwestern. Walker and Isley were soon inseparable and married in Tulsa in 1939. Walker eventually went out to Hollywood and got a successful career started. Meanwhile, his wife went home to Oklahoma where she bore their two sons. With Walker working steadily on the radio drama Maudie's Diary, his wife decided to return to Hollywood where she caught the eye of MGM executive David O. Selznick. Selznick saw potential in the bright-eyed Phyllis Isley and started prepping her for stardom. But that name had to go, so Phyllis Isley became Jennifer Jones. Sure wish you could spend the rest of the evening with us. Oh, no, you don't. I butted in enough already. No, we loved meeting you, didn't we, Bill? Sure we did. I'll catch a bus here. So long, buddy. Goodbye. You've both been swell. You're the only people I've met since I came to town. Well, why didn't you go to the canteen? Oh, they're so crowded and everything, and I don't dance so very good. You and me both. Next time you come to town, maybe we can all go bowling again. Gee, I don't know if I'll ever be back this way. And I expect we'll get going any day now. War looks pretty good, doesn't it? Sure does. Well, goodbye, miss. My name's Harold E. Smith. Well, I'm uh, Bill Smollett, and this is Miss Hilton. How are you? Jane's my first name. Goodbye, Jane. Goodbye. With the war in Europe being felt by Americans for the last three years, by 1944, Hollywood had looked at it from nearly every angle. Producer David O. Selznick had made his bones creating the mother of all epics, Gone with the Wind, and hoped to recreate that success for the war effort. Aided with two Best Picture Oscars for Gone with the Wind and Rebecca, Selznick could write his own ticket, and soon discovered Margaret Beale Wilder's novel Since You Went Away. The novel, told as a series of letters written by a war wife to her overseas husband, enchanted Selznick, who brought the authors to Hollywood to adapt her work. Unfortunately, Wilder's book didn't immediately lend itself to a feature, and Selznick, realizing the novel would need to be fleshed out to film length, just decided to take the reins himself. He eventually churned out a near three-hour melodrama covering nearly every facet of the home front, from the questions of familial sacrifice to discussion about the levels of masculinity. Suffice it to say, it was a different take on the war compared to previous films that had come out from the genre. Like Selznick's previous features, Since You Went Away boasted an amazing cast of big names and soon-to-be legends. Claudette Colbert leads the charge as matriarch Anne Hilton, but she wasn't the actress campaigning heavily for the role. Prominent theater star Catherine Cornell wanted the role desperately, but her only film credit at that point was as herself in the war musical Stage Door Canteen. Selznick instead went to Colbert, who, at 38, didn't want to play the mother of a teenager quite yet. It was up to Selznick to convince Colbert that it was her patriotic duty to star in the film. 
though she had just done her war picture with 1943's So Proudly We Hail. I'm sure Selznick's significant salary helped as well. He also convinced Shirley Temple to come out of retirement to star as the youngest Hilton daughter, Brig. Temple had semi-retired in 1942 to focus on school, but when Selznick offered her the part, the actress thought that this would help transition her to adult features. But may I make so bold as to ask whether you expect me to bathe under that? But golly, Colonel Smart, there's a shower off Pop's room. I mean, off your room. Pop always used a shower. Since you went away, is filled with the love and laughter, the hopes and dreams of an American family. The kind of family 11 million Americans once fought for. Really, though, for Selznick, the rest of the cast was irrelevant. The real star of the movie was meant to be Jennifer Jones, playing Anne's eldest daughter, Jane. Jones was on the rise after winning an Academy Award for the Song of Bernadette, and Selznick hoped that playing Jane would showcase Jones as a regular down-to-earth girl. Through Selznick's grooming of Jones, Walker was able to secure a contract at the same studio. Walker's all-American boy presence helped him during the war years, but by the early 40s, Jones was a bigger star and in a well-known affair with Selznick. It's alleged that Selznick cast Walker opposite Jones in this movie to profit on the publicity of their real-life marriage, but it's really hard not to see this as Selznick's attempt to gaslight Walker on set, forcing the couple to do endless takes of love scenes all under his watchful eye. By the time the film was released in 1944, Jones and Walker had separated, and the two would be divorced by 1945, and Jennifer Jones would become the next Mrs. David O. Selznick in 1949. Since She Went Away was a hit at the box office, making $7 million on a budget of just over three, and it secured nine Oscar nominations, though it was just Max Steiner's score that took the award home. In the long run, Since You Went Away was not the Gone with the Wind size epic Selznick had hoped for, though it does have a devout following and is a beautifully constructed film. Want to hear one of my ideas for a perfect murder? Two fellows meet accidentally. No connection between them at all. Never saw each other before. Each one has somebody that he'd like to get rid of. So, they swap murders. Crisscross. I may be old-fashioned, but I thought murder was against the law. You think my theory's okay, Connie? You like it? Sure, sure. Now, everything didn't go smoothly. She doesn't want the divorce. But you sound so savage, Guy. Sure, I sound savage. I feel savage. I like to break a neck. Now, who did you say this is? Bruno, Guy. Bruno Anthony. Don't you remember? On the train. Critics loved Robert Walker in Since You Went Away. Bosley Crowther called him in his review, quote, uncommonly appealing. After all the successes that he'd racked up during the war, Walker transitioned over to romantic comedies, starting with the Hedy Lamarr film Her Highness and the Bellboy in 1945 and The Sailor Takes a Wife, which paired him with June Allison. But Walker felt he wasn't getting the roles he should have. Around this time, possibly as a reaction to Jennifer Jones' marriage to David O. Selznick, Walker married John Ford's daughter Barbara. But the impulsive marriage was fraught with loud fights and Walker's public drunkenness, and the two ended up divorcing just five months later. Walker would close out 1949 by committing himself to a sanatorium. After his release, he was still saddled with flops and was loaned out to Warner Brothers. But the loaner ended up leading the actor to his best-known performance. In 1951, Alfred Hitchcock cast him as a charming, scheming sociopath in Strangers on a Train. In 51, the actor had finished principal photography and was working on reshoots for the Leo McCary feature My Son John after Strangers on a Train, another film for which he got incredibly high praise. Unfortunately, there wasn't much to go on after this. The events of Walker's demise are murky, but it's said that his drinking was still out of control, and for reasons that are unexplained, on the night of August 28, 1951, Walker was in an agitated state. His housekeeper, unable to calm him, called Walker's psychiatrist, who came over and administered a sedative. Unaware that Walker had been drinking heavily, the sedative and the alcohol triggered a fatal allergic reaction. Robert Walker died at the age of 32. Scenes from Strangers on a Train ended up being reused for My Son John to cover up for Walker's death. 
He'd only just been given a chance to stretch his wings before he passed, and it's a shame the films will never see. However, in just a brief stretch of time, Robert Walker showed us he could be kind, sensitive, manipulative, and frightening all in one. After the break, Drea Clark joins me to discuss Robert Walker and Since You Went Away. You know, I read of a case once. I think it would be a wonderful idea. I can take him out in the car, and when we get to a very lonely spot, knock him on the head with a hammer, pour gasoline over him and over the car, and set the whole thing ablaze. <laughs> then have to walk all the way home. No. Oh, no, no, no. Oh. I have the best way and the best tools. Simple, silent, and quick. The silent part being the most important. Let me show you what I mean. You don't mind if I borrow your neck for a moment, do you? So we are honoring actor Robert Walker for the month of August. And joining me to discuss one of his films is the wonderful and amazing Drea Clark. Drea, how are you today? I am good, Kristen. Thank you. Thank you for jumping on the podcast to talk to me about a very long film. <laughs> we watched a nearly <laughs> three-hour movie today. At least I did. At the time of recording, I had finished the movie about two hours ago. Nice. Yeah, Fresh yeah. in the mind. But Drea, for people who don't know who you are, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do online, all that good stuff. Sure. I'm predominantly a film programmer for a variety of festivals. I'm the senior programmer at LA Film Fest, which I'm working on right now. And then I also program for Sundance and Bentonville, which is the festival Gina Davis started in Arkansas that concentrates on highlighting films by and featuring women and people of color. And then I produce indie films. I've made three features, which people are welcome to check out. I think they're great. I'm a regular guest on another movie podcast of much newer films called Who Shot Ya? Who Shot Ya is a great, great podcast filled with wonderful people. So if you are not listening and you want newer movies to supplement your classic film knowledge, I recommend it. Yes, for a well-balanced diet. We are going all the way back to 1944. For this episode, we're talking about Since You Went Away, starring pretty much every major star you can think of in <laughs> 1944. So we're talking Robert Walker this month. Drea, what was your prior knowledge about Robert Walker and this film before watching it? <laughs> You know what? It was pretty limited, and it's interesting because the second he pops up on screen, he actually looks a good deal like my grandpa at that age. <laughs> my grandpa was a Marine, so their uniforms were different, and I'm sure the uniform itself probably also clouded my judgment, but it was enough that I took note. In researching him further, was amazed, as I'm sure we'll discuss, the intricate personal details of what was happening behind the scenes in this film. He had a really likable quality to him. Very, very boyish, which is perfect for that soldier that you want to be worried about from the minute you meet them. Robert Walker, I know more for the background, what happened to him, I think, which right. is what most people know. But I had only ever seen one Robert Walker film, which is Strangers on a Train. We'd already talked about Rope when we talked about John Dahl, which is very similar to Strangers on a Train, and I have a limited love for Hitchcock as it is, so sometimes you gotta, you gotta mix it up. So I went with a rom-com. Well, a rom-com, I guess, is the, the term. A fam rom-com. Yes. I thought about doing The Clock originally, which is from 1945, okay. which has Judy Garland, which is a fantastic, fantastic movie. If you have not gone and seen that, and you like this, I would recommend going to watch that movie. But I figured, let's go with something from early in his career-ish. He had been working since 1943, credited, even though he had made two uncredited appearances before this. This was very, very early in his career. I think this was only the fourth film that he had made. So I figured I'd mix it up a little bit. What did you think about the movie overall? Overall, I was surprised to find it as engaging and quick-moving as it seemed. As you mentioned, it's almost three hours long. It is a chock-a-block story. But I don't know if it's because of my contemporary eyes. It really almost felt more like marathoning a limited series than watching a film. It didn't have that same dedicated three-act structure that we sort of feel in our bones at this point because there's so much effort put into the town around them. Like, there's a lot of scenes that give us a sense of time and place 
that don't necessarily move the story along at all, which with modern eyes can be laborious, except for I thought it, it had a nice lightness to almost all of it, especially for something that starts with a woman weeping because she's just sent her husband and the father of her children off to war. It was surprisingly more lighthearted than I was expecting. This is a movie that, despite being three hours, I felt, like you said, moves very quickly. Even though there is an opening and an intermission. So those add a little bit to the runtime as well. But overall, when people look at early in the 40s, when they were doing these slice-of-life movies to show the home front, that this is one of those movies where it seems self-aware of how all the other movies had gone and then thus tries to change something. So this is credited to David O. Selznick. He wrote the script, but they gave him a producing credit in lieu of a screenwriting credit. And what really works to Selznick's credit, and I don't give Selznick a lot of credit because he was a horrid human being. Agreed. Is, is that he had seen all these other movies that had come out about the home front and sought to do something and say something different. So, I don't know about you, did you see commonalities to other films while watching this? I did in the sense of, we talk about now looking back at America as a greatness, and that the American home front during the war was one of the things that's referencing. That a lot of these center around an ambiguous Midwestern setting with a range of characters, some comedic, some dramatic, that to them is the full slice of life. And looking back now, we're like, well, that's actually a pretty limited slice that we're seeing there. There was something about the tone of it. I said that it's an unexpected lightness, and I think it's because I had Gone with the Wind in my head, his previous big Oscar winner, which is more melodramatic and more prone to the darkness. Whereas this definitely as you're saying, picks up on that American home front. It has more of the lightness of things that have like a musical quality to them or something that makes them more engaging to a broad audience that needs to have a little sugar when it's talking about this ongoing war. Selznick really wanted this to be an epic which is why he ended up vastly changing the book, which Margaret Buell Wilder is the author, and her book is an epistolary novel, so it's told in letters. He actually had to vastly change the book in order to make it a three-hour movie, and this is the most expensive film since Gone with the Wind. But what I think this movie does better than even something like Gone with the Wind, Gone with the Wind is a war movie in the sense that the war happens, You have to watch Scarlett O'Hara adapt to the war and get over her selfishness. And it's really a character study with a war movie in there. At least that's how I see it. I'm sure somebody's rolling their eyes right now saying that's not (laughs) at all what Gone with the Wind is about. But I compared this to Mrs. Miniver, which Mm -hmm. was from 1942, which was what this movie wanted to be and also rail against. That movie I have problems with. And I have problems with this movie, too. This depicts the home front as very white, which we all expect, but Mm -hmm. also very upper class. Even though Mrs. Miniver and this are supposed to be middle class family, the average American family, and people were not nearly as bad as they were in the Depression, but this is still showing you a very Hollywoodized version of what your home was supposed to look like. Even something like Mimi in St. Louis, which came or at the same time, is still very much this upwardly mobile movie about how you either lose everything in these movies or you stay relatively stable as a means of showing, like, you can do it. Well, I wonder if it's in response, like you said, Mrs. Miniver is set in London, and so there's that British sheen of even lower class British representation can often seem snooty to an American audience if there's an accent and you start to put in titles, the Royal Air Force, there's things of that. Yeah, it's like keep calm and carry on type of Exactly. I wonder if Selznick's response to that in his attempt to replicate but improve upon and Americanize took that still as a challenge that we wanted to look as good as the Brits in all ways. This isn't like Mrs. Miniver if, if anybody's seen that movie. Right. The war comes into their home. 
there's a Nazi that literally lands in their house, and they have to deal with that. This movie has a lot of surprises for me that I was not expecting, and one of the things that I really didn't expect was that there is no third act, the war is coming for us. There's not an air raid at all yeah. in this movie. <laughs> well, that's one of the most unique things about both of the world wars that this country's gone through. The biggest wars, really, even everything in the Middle East to Vietnam. We are removed physically from it, and so our art is as well. Like you said, there's not a Nazi that's going to land in your home if your home is in the Midwest of America during a war. They always refer to it like, oh, the boys are shipping out. There's an away game quality to capturing World War II that's very unique to the American perspective. What I appreciated, too, is that there's not a lot of speechifying, too. Yes, there are moments where the characters get a bit indignant. Jennifer Jones's Jane has that great speech with Agnes Moorhead, who plays oh. the friend, where she talks about how Agnes Moorhead's character Emily hasn't given anything up, and how dare she critique the men who go off to war and the women who stay to help them cope. But there's no grand we're going to endure. There's no Scarlett O'Hara, tomorrow is another day type sure. of moment. Which I appreciated because I think by 44, the war ended in what, 46 in the US? So we had seen so many of these movies that I think Selznick was like, we've had speeches, now we're just in the slog just dealing with the dead at this point. There's really no need to tell us what we already know. Well, and it is an interesting narrative angle, him using that to build out the letters that the source material was based on. It's so true of how the American experience would be during the war. These women are genuinely looking for some way to help, all of them, even from Brig the youngest to Jane to Anne who starts welding at one point. It's not the same as being in direct fire, and because of that, there's a unique guilt that comes with it, and it affects the characters of what are we doing to alleviate our guilt and help this cause. And it's funny that this emotional hierarchy of who cares the most starts to resonate. Like you said, Agnes Moorhead's character, who I thought could even be much more dastardly. I could tell she was set up for them to be the foil and to be bringing in this distanced and haughty attitude, but I really thought she could have gone much more terrible. They wouldn't have known this in 1944, but watching it in 2018, there's a unique acknowledgement of what we now know as privilege. Yeah. You know, Claudette Colbert's character, Anne, has the moment where she talks to Agnes Moorhead. Agnes Moorhead's character, Emily, is the one, like, hoarding food, has dances with the boys as her means of helping. But it's not really doing anything. It's just putting a nice, shiny veneer on everything. And so when Anne realizes, Emily throws at her, well, I don't see you making any sacrifices for anything. And Anne says, you know what? You're right. I haven't sacrificed anything. I haven't gone off and given my time like her daughter has, becoming a nurse. That's a different thing to say because it's a character who, in 2018, you're going to notice it, is a white woman who could have been the definition of white feminism, saying, I feel terrible that I haven't done anything. What can I do to change that? And I had to give the movie a pat on the back. I had the same exact reaction that, it's not progressive, but it is, especially for the time period, there is an awareness of that unnamed privilege with all of these women. And it's, again, it's less about alleviating how they feel and more of them looking at an overview of what am I doing to improve things for this country, for my community. I also found with Hattie McDaniel's character, because I mentioned to you, I didn't know she was in this before I was looking it up. And the minute I saw her name in the cast list, I had that uh, that back of your neck crinkle happen with the worry of how she would be utilized. As much as she's there in a servant role, I was also pleasantly surprised that from the first time we see her, even how she's dressed, she's in this really beautiful suit with a hat. And she's also establishing her own term. She's doing them a favor by helping out. She's gone and found employment elsewhere. Claudette's character, Anne, is gracious to her. Both Claudette's character and Joseph Cotton's character treat her as familiars, as peers in a sense, much more than I was expecting of how they respect her time and 
part of the family. Again, there's the sort of problematic moments and there's things in that that I always worry of how they were asking her to portray a woman of her race and class versus how that woman would actually have been. But I still thought it was a more delicate handling of her character than I was expecting. People forget that Claudette Colbert was one of those actresses that had done movies where she had played an equal to a woman of color. I thought of 1934's, the original version of Imitation of Life, where she played opposite Louise Beavers, and they are both single women raising children and trying to make it in the world. Watching this, Hattie McDaniel's got the affectations that are very stereotypical in the way she speaks. But for the most part, she says to them, I'm making my money, but at the same time, these people aren't my family. I want to be with you guys. The children defer to her. There's this real equality in the home between the two women. And she's always included. It's not like this pity, oh, we should invite Fidelia to yes. come hang out. No, it's the knowledge that she is included. If, if people don't notice it, it's a very brief moment. But there's that fantastic long shot in the train station where you see shot yes. of an African-American officer with his wife and child as he's about to go to war. And it's just one scene, but the camera puts him front and center in that moment, reminding the audience that, hey, this is men of all stripes are fighting in this war. The movie didn't have to do that. And I'm not saying that we solved race relations in this movie. I thought it was really nice to see some acknowledgement of the men who weren't white, who were risking their lives for this country. I thought that was a really great inclusion in there. And like you said, that it's not just him as a soldier, it's him with his family, he's holding a crying child. They go the extra step of you hear the ADR voiceover of this kid saying how much they were going to miss their daddy. It's a fully humanized moment. I was actually really taken by the cinematography. I'm not usually taken by cinematography unless it's like James Wong Howe or something like that, but there were some really great shots courtesy of Stanley Cortez and League Arms with George Barnes and Robert Bruce who were uncredited DPs. And so I had to just bring them up. I thought there was some lovely cinematography. Jane, after she says goodbye to Robert Walker's character, she's just standing at the train station. There's this nice long shot that gives the shadows. There's a lot of great interplay of shadows in this. It's like if a noir movie just walked into a war film very briefly. The three women, Anne and Jane and Brig, are walking away the way their shadows are cast on the floor. It's very interesting to see such great cinematography in what was a genre that I don't necessarily think, unless you were showing war footage, was really known for glamorizing the shots. It also isn't something that always stands out to me, so that I know when it does, it's doing some really heavy lifting. Normally, these films, anything that's set in such a domestic setting, we're in their kitchen a lot, so much of it is in the home, and it's this home run and dominated by feminine presence, that's often just given static shots and very flat lighting. The idea is to just give them the broadest lighting possible so it looks clean and bright and well lit. Whereas this, there's a lot of times where They'll just be preparing tea or toast or the colonel's poached eggs. And there's beautiful lattice work coming in from the outside in the shadows of leaves. And not just the lighting of it, I think, stands out and so much care was given to it, but there's a lot more movement with the camera and the characters within the frame than a lot of films, certainly of this time and definitely of this genre. There's always beautiful interplay between what's happening in the foreground and the background. It's a scene in the kitchen. It's not just someone who comes one place and chops something because that's not how people move. The cinematography and the direction allows for the characters are bobbing and weaving around each other and they circle from here and then they end up in another space. So it's a really fluid looking film which again, for something so domestically set, is a nice juxtaposition. And it's worth pointing out, this movie had several directors. 
that jumped in and out while they were making this. This movie's credited to director John Cromwell, who was a jack of all trades. He did a ton of movies, all different genres. He did this, he did The Enchanted Cottage, he made some Carol Lombard movies, he did the Agnes Moorhead film Caged, <laughs> which is a great film if you've yeah. never seen it. So I mean, he did a little bit of everything, but this uncredited work went to Edward Klein, who did a couple things. I think he did some of the comedy scenes. Tay Garnett was in here. He was normally a director of melodramas and romance. And then Selznick himself, because God forbid he didn't get a chance to do everything. If you watch something like The Wizard of Oz or Gone with the Wind, you can tell the different directors this was a King Vidor moment or something like that. Sure. It's remarkable how fluid everything feels. I can't tell you where the Tay Garnett stuff and the John Cromwell stuff begins or ends. And the fact that it's as cohesive, that it's not just that one begins and ends, but when you're juggling tones like that, it can draw you out as an audience member. And this, all of the tones felt true to this piece and these characters. So even if they were bouncing about laughter and moments and then a very jarring shot like the father of the recently deceased soldier walking past them in the theater with the black armband will go quickly into something comedic and you're not taken out of it because it's overall cohesiveness. It's really impressive. Whoever well, stitched that together. I was really afraid there's a scene where it's very heavy and pendulous and then the dog walks in. <laughs> There's two comedic points in this that are just physical that made me so happy, and they work. And both of them are also utilized more than once. The bulldog and his relationship with the colonel made me laugh every time. I always was happy smile, and it wasn't disruptive. And then the absurd girl neighbor Gladys, who didn't talk, was such a weirdo conclusion and it was such a nice little reprieve to end a scene that's one of those moments that made me feel more television almost like you need that bumper for the end of the scene before you go to commercial and here would come Gladys running in and giving a weird look and then running out again but I still appreciated it and it didn't disrupt the emotional flow Gladys was great. It was an uncredited part attributed to Jane Devlin, and she is just hilarious. Why does she not talk? I don't know. <laughs> but it's great that she just pops up the one moment where they're like, Gladys has something to say, and you're like, oh, <laughs> finally, we're going to hear something. She's like, nope, done. I'm out. It's great, and it's amazing how many character actors and just weird inclusions are included here. I mean, we talk about the cast is stacked. You don't just oh, have yeah. Colbert, Jennifer Jones, Joseph Cotton, Shirley Temple, Monty Woolley, Lionel Barrymore's in there for 90 seconds. Robert Walker, I mean, you also have Guy Madison's got a part, Alan Nazmova is in there, Keenan Wynn. But then you start looking down at all the uncredited people that just popped up in <laughs> random parts. You have Dorothy Dandridge. She plays the wife of the black officer at the train station. That's Dorothy oh, Dandridge right there. I saw her in the credits, the IMDb credits, but I hadn't caught her on screen. Oh my gosh, I didn't yeah. even recognize her. Famed noir actress Rhonda Fleming is one of the girls at the dance. I don't know which girl, that's what I she's, think she's credited as. I think she's one of the girls that comes out of the trucks. I can't remember which callback it is, but you know, it's maybe the most perfect example of the male gaze you'll ever see are these women literally presented one by one. Right. They come out of a truck to this field of soldiers. Butterfly McQueen plays a whack sergeant. Again, throwing another callback to Gone with the Wind. Terry Moore plays one of the refugee children on the train before she did Mighty Joe Young. Ruth Roman is in this movie, technically. Eileen <laughs> Pringle. I'm, I'm Doodles Weavers there. It is insane. How many people were actually in this movie? <laughs> you have a three-hour movie by David O. Selznick. You get yeah. to stack the deck. We got to talk about David O. Because he permeates everything in this movie, whether he wants to or not. And we can't talk about him without talking about our star of the month, which is Robert Walker. 
Robert Walker, best known for playing the villain in Strangers on a Train, but had a very lengthy career before dying relatively young. He plays Bill Smollett II, the grandson to Monty Woolley's character. And in case you're curious, Robert Walker died at 32. He died in 51. He made one movie after Strangers on a Train. Technically, that includes footage from Strangers on a Train because he died in the middle of production. But he plays the grandson, Monty Woolley's character, who is considered a burden and a disgrace because he's not brave. He's not the male example of American G.I. Joe going off to war with his head held high. He doesn't really want to do that. Is very progressive in 2018, but it felt like we were trolling him the entire time if you know the backstory. (laughs) And it's funny, as I think I said, Strangers on a Train is the only thing that I recognized him for, which is why I was so taken aback by his boyishness in this. But you're right, it's his performance, but every single time we see Bill, his soldier, he's so awkward, but it's always tempered by a politeness or something that we would admire. So it's this thing of, I'm sure he was constantly like, are you making fun of me? Am I the butt of a joke here? Because yeah, it's almost like he's that, being gaslit in every scene yes, by, it's by that, Selznick. It's that give and take. He's a soldier. He's enlisted. He's signed up himself. But then he's mocked for having not been strong enough for West Point. They have a strange exchange with a Navy man when they're bowling. And he's really weird about it and very threatened. But then he's the nice guy and they end up making a friend out of it. So it's every time you think he's being played like the chump, it's rounded out just enough. He must have felt... <laughs> well, I'm sure he was feeling a lot while they were shooting this. It's funny. Jennifer Jones says at a certain point to him, why do you do that? Why do you ask if you can smoke? Why do you not just do it? And I was like, because he's polite? I'm not really understanding why you're complaining yeah. about this guy asking you if it's okay if he smokes. But it really does make you second guess the concept of masculinity this movie plays differently now than it probably did in 44 because in 44 bill is presented as this weak guy who yeah he's nice but he's not built for a war so when he dies you're just like oh yeah well eh, that's that sucks but at least jen's gonna move on she's gonna be okay whereas now in in 2018 when we're looking at the definitions of masculinity and who says what makes a man you're watching robert walker and The character is just a polite guy. He's not a pacifist. He's doing what he has to do for his country, but he's not made for that. And that's okay. If anything, Mm. we should be condemning the fact that the war has put him in this position and that his life essentially is rendered moot because he's not built for it. Which makes me question, do you think this is a pro-war or anti-war film? Because I was sitting there thinking... The movie's not really saying it's for going off into war. You know, there's nothing poetic or or grandiose about these people that go off to war. They die or they're missing in action. And since we're only watching the people that are back home. So I don't think it's pro, but at the same time, it's not saying war is terrible. We must stop it. I feel that this film was very much taking a female audience into consideration. And that the pro-war sentiment was in terms of redirecting thought to what can the women and the people left behind do? What kind of victory gardens can your old men sow? (laughs) I don't garden. What kind of work can they be doing? What kind of volunteering? There's this occasionally utilized othering of the enemy. They say the word Japs several times in obviously very despondent ways. The moment to me that was the most glaring in terms of, oh, this was made many years ago, When the cop pulls them over, he mentions in a, like, humorous way, I hope you kill a lot of Japs. And then he literally pulls his eyelids back in this horrifying caricature. (laughs) And I was like, oh, gross, gross. Especially because it's for a comedic moment, too. It's more that that sentiment of less pro-war, but more American duty. And remember who the bad guys are and keep your head down and nose to the grindstone. I guess the American version of keep calm and carry on. It's less about fanning the flames and more about keeping the masses in line. Well, there's also this idea that there are forces bigger than us at play. This is the government. Nobody's marching on Washington. So it's the concept of 
this is just how life is. It, it's almost complacent, which is again very relatable I think to right now where a lot of us are saying with our current political structure, well, what do we do? We can't do anything. Individuals can't do anything. We just have right. to endure it. So it does have that, but Robert Walker does very good with the role that does definitely feel like it's poking fun at him. And a lot of that has to do with if you know what was going on, the scenes that he has with Jennifer Jones who plays Jane. Now the two were married. They were married in 1939. I believe this was the first and last time they made a movie together. But by this point, Jennifer Jones was in a well-known public affair with David O. Selznick. Now, her and Robert Walker would end up divorcing while they were filming this movie, and Robert Walker had long-standing mental health issues after the fact that a lot of people laid at Jennifer Jones's feet. And then he ended up dying under very weird circumstances at the age of 32. Watching this, the scenes with him and Jennifer Jones, I still believe their chemistry is palpable. They oh. are still adorable together in this very chaste way. It's a very, very chaste relationship, which you figure it has to be considering who wrote the script and who was producer and who was banging the leading lady and who was on set every day. But David O. Selznick would actually force the two to do the scenes over and over and over again purely to screw with Robert Walker. I was just sitting there thinking, oh my god, this poor guy. And I think that adds to the timidity of Robert Walker's performance. But at the end, when he goes on the train and she's chasing the train and, you know, they're both saying goodbye to each other, I was sitting there thinking, no, this is a couple that still loves each other. I still bought that, you know what, they were into each other regardless. There are complications I didn't discover until after I had seen it and then was reading and then was like, wait, what? Because it seems like such cruelty to cast him in that in the first place, why he did it, what personal sacrifices he made, or if he was thinking that would repair his relationship, I have no idea. But the idea of being in a role where you are meant to be falling in love with the person who is actually your current wife, it is a messiness that if it came up as a plot point, in a TV show, we'd be like, there's a little too much. Scale back a little of this. But for it to be reality was absolutely bonkers. It is interesting knowing his ultimate end, his struggles with addiction, with mental illness, and what all that could have factored into both his performance and why he would do this film. It's heartbreaking because Bill is this character of supreme vulnerability and I am totally with you people either have on-screen chemistry or they don't and these two made total sense that sparky wonder about them it's heartbreaking in a few different ways full disclosure I am pro Jennifer Jones I love her if anybody's seen Song of Bernadette she's great in that movie Jennifer Jones gets so much crap she gets so much guff mostly because of the Robert Walker stuff and I think a lot of that is unfair if you you read up and you find out that what we know in 2018 would be a power imbalance between her and Selznick it was pretty well documented that she did not want to get divorced from Robert Walker and that she was essentially compelled to and that the relationship with Selznick was not happy she did stay with him till Selznick died they had a child together. She ended up very, very messed up, too, as a result of what was a very contentious relationship. Her daughter with David O. Selznick ended up committing suicide at a young age, so that was not a happy relationship either. So I feel she gets a lot of flack when we don't give Selznick flack for right. the things that we know about him. But I do think she's very good in this movie. This was the longest ever performance for a supporting actress to receive a nomination. She's in about 90 minutes of this movie. She's very sweet. She always played sweet. She didn't really have a lot of range, and that's fine. But what she did have, I thought, was very good. She's that bright, sunny, all-American girl. You do root for her in Robert Walker. She's sweet in a way that can pull off having the mumps and being yes. crushed. And actually, you know, knowing that Selznick wrote it as well, there's strange things there about wanting the woman you have a sexual relationship to be playing this very green child woman, teenager, but whatever, that's a whole other thing. But she carries off a lot of dialogue and moments 
that in lesser hands would just be awkward. You know, just every single time she says Tony, Joseph Cotton's name, oh, Tony, there's something there that could just be wooden or forced, but she is always operating on a bunch of levels that she's emotionally torn and she's drawn in this way and she has the teenage whirlwind emotional brain going on and on top of it all remains really likable and her own person. She does a wonderful job. You brought up the fact that David O'Selznick writes her as this child woman in love with her not uncle. (laughs) Which was the problem. That was more than anything else. My problem with this movie is that she's in love with Joseph Cotton's character, who is apparently liquid sex, because not only is she in love with him, but he's also harboring this love for Claudette Colbert's character that has supposedly been long-standing, and he does not make any bones about the fact. He, he openly tells her, your husband's gone, but I'm still into you. The kids talk about their dad, and he's like, well, that's great. Don't rub it in. Like, who are you, okay? You're living in our house. You're not even our uncle. But it is weird. It's very weird watching this, which Joseph Cotton became the funny uncle in a lot of movies. I thought of immediately of Shadow of a Doubt, which has another dark-haired actress, Teresa Wright, who was in Mrs. Miniver, who was the Jennifer Jones-esque type of character. And then you also have the fact that Jennifer Jones and Joseph Cotton played lovers in 1948 in Portrait of Jenny, which is a very (laughs) weird movie. And so watching this, knowing that Selznick wrote the script and that Selznick was older than Jennifer Jones, I'm just sitting there thinking, oh no, it's one of those stories, isn't it? Like, you needed to purge some stuff. And you're like, I'm just going to write it down on the page and let them act it. (laughs) Now, I feel like a perv because I had the opposite reaction. Oh, okay. Which is because... There are no pervs on this podcast. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know if it's because I was also the kind of teenage girl that was always prone to having crushes on people who were just older than me. You're preaching to the choir. You are really good company. (laughs) that, That was my sweet spot. Totally unattainable... But admirable people, but come on, just ridiculous. I was floored the entire time with what I saw as Joseph Cotton's character of Tony. I was impressed that I never felt any leering or inappropriateness from him towards her. I felt that he managed to treat her as a child, but respectfully. So he wasn't ever condescending to her, and he was sensitive to how she felt. He always knew how she felt, but he was able to diffuse it over and over again without making her feel awkward or worse, which would have been what I had been thinking of if I was her age. So I was appreciative that there are so many movies from the entirety of the history of cinema where I can watch an older man and a younger woman and feel, ugh, that's not appropriate. That's just not cool. He is not being cool in how he's treating her. And I never felt that in relation to how Tony was with Jane. I thought he was upfront with her and respected where she was coming from, but kept the distances he needed to. Definitely not Gidget or um, The Bachelor and the Bobby Sox or with Shirley Temple sure. and Cary Grant where they're legally required to date. Any co-star Audrey Hepburn ever had was like 80 years older than her. I loved them all, but still. And this one, there very much could have been a wink to his attraction, but there wasn't. He gives her a chaste kiss on the forehead. And I'm wondering if you and I will actually also then have differing views on his relationship with Anne, which you've touched on, that he is admitted that he's held a candle for for years and pines over and she's a woman whose husband their mutual friend is away at war and I actually thought that machinations or not it was the smartest way to incorporate a romantic male lead to let him be nothing but charming and attractive literally her companion and her date and her flirtation but always in a very neutered way. I never felt she was leading him on. I felt they were as equally upfront about his romantic situation. She was not in one with him. I liked that. You know, there's a lot of film that's just, and you know, romances, it's the bread and butter of them that's fueled by 
if only I had said something and miscommunications and this, everything was on the table. And then you were just allowed to enjoy how they were then maneuvering within those boundaries. You bring up something I hadn't noticed. That's a really smart way to incorporate a not love story into this movie. She doesn't give him any indication that she's interested. He, I think, is the one that gives all indication that he's interested. He does not hide the fact that he's into her. The painting that he makes where he uses her face as the the advertisement for the waves, and it's her on a cheesecake painting, and he doesn't see how there's any problem with that. I was almost tempted to believe they were going to kill off dear old dad and allow that as Tony's way to get into the family. But they don't, which I thought was unique. I very much expected it. He's like the Lori of this movie. Uh, this <gasps> yes! <movie> <laughs> Poor yes. Lori. The he, constant yes. neutered companion. One who's like, I will literally take any of you, okay? Just let me <laughs> into this family, darn it. Joseph Cotton's good. I'm not big on him in general, but I do think he's good. <laughs> Well, it's also how Tony's written, speaking again to what I perceived as a very obvious female audience that this was intended for, it's ideal because he's attractive and devoted and charming and charismatic, but he's also desirable to other women. They frequently run into the sugar. Hey, sugar, you call me sometime that he's dated or squired about at other times. But he's never sleazy. He wants to be domesticated. Tony, you could write a whole essay on how he ruined the concept of what you could expect from a good-looking leading man because that guy would never be so (laughs) well-behaved. Well, and he contrasts nicely with Robert Walker, where Tony is the tall, good-looking Navy man. Robert Walker's character is bleak and just nice and pleasant. And then that's all contrasted with Smollett, played by Monty Wilkes, who is Robert Walker's character's grandfather, who is the retired, long-term military man. I think he says he's he was forcibly retired because they felt that at his age he served no purpose. And what I love about the Monty Woolley character more than anything, which... Really, he's just the man who came to dinner again in a different house. The movie really has his plot line be this gut punch that we have no time for pride. Essentially, the movie ends with him saying he's not going to say goodbye to his grandson who's going to go off to war, and then he misses the train. He does show up, but he's missed the train. He's missed his opportunity to redeem himself, and then... Robert Walker's character dies and he realizes that like his only chance at having a family was undone because you know I'm not saying that Robert Walker's character would have survived had Monty Woolley's character shown up and given him a pat on the back it is pretty much saying that you know this kind of era of being prideful because somebody doesn't conform to your expectations is unnecessary and it's gonna plague you for the rest of your days because you didn't take your opportunities when you had them I love you mentioning pride at all, because the minute that the colonel is introduced, I got such a Jane Austen character from him. He was a combination of the aunt in Pride and Prejudice, but even the strange vicar, that cousin that stays with them. But he's comedic relief, he's a different, older perspective, and you're right, the pride of his relationship, it does give a nice arc to it above and beyond something that could have seemed really really regretful of how could you banish your grandson it played out nicely because of his performance because of the layers of gruffness and vulnerability you'd already seen in him I won't lie when Jane gives him the pocket watch that he had originally given his grandson and it had sort of gone full I cried. I got legitimately teary thinking of the family ties of that, of expectations of men and the pride of men. And I thought it did a really nice job with a full circle of his character. Well, it's also the fact that the telegram that announces his death goes to Jane and not to two. And he's like, I wasn't even worthy of being next of kin. All of that is really emotionally impactful, especially if you're somebody who's ever had regret over somebody dying, like, hits you right in the gut right there. It telegraphs really nicely his personality is a 
speak first and then reconsider and apologize later. Just in the small exchanges, he's so insulting to Tony when he meets him, and he's like, the Navy, which is actually one of the funniest lines of the whole movie. But then he laughed, I'd never be friends with the man in the Navy. And then he slams his door, and then he comes out a moment later, and it's like, but of course, I guess the military needs a Navy. The idea that this character, even in the small snippets we get, is so shown to be someone who acts and speaks boldly, who makes proclamations right away, and then is constantly, for all of them, having to backstep that, it makes it that much more poignant and heartbreaking. He will never get to backstep that with his grandson. Like you were saying, if you've ever lost someone, the permanence of what you'll never get to say reads so much stronger. Well, at least he's got Soda, the dog. (laughs) Ah, the dog. (laughs) We haven't talked about Shirley Temple. (laughs) <laughs> who plays Brig. I will be blunt. I think Shirley Temple's films as an adult, or at least as a teenager, she is not good in them. I think she proved that she was very good at being cute and a child, and then when that ended, you really realized how specific her movies as a child were towards what she was good at. This is a roundabout way of saying I did not like her character in this movie. <laughs> uh, I think she was cast for name recognition. She had gotten men through the Depression. What was it Franklin Roosevelt said? For 10 cents, you can go and see a baby smile and realize the world makes sense again. And I think that's what they were doing here. Shirley Temple can get through it. She can remind you of how you can get through it. But it doesn't work when you're dealing with, you know, like a 16, 17-year-old girl. She's a little over the top. I did feel that everything was like her Shirley Temple performance. She has line readings in here where it was just like, yes. she's making pouty face. Um, and I was just, I was Gee, just not Pops. having it. <laughs> Why didn't Pops write me? Exactly. Yeah. Or, or the crying. When she cries, it literally feels like somebody is just like laying on your shoulder, like heaving into your mouth. <laughs> it's just, it's <laughs> not good. It's not good. She is not good in this movie. I will agree with you that she is definitely the performance that I see the outer edges of what she's doing at all times. I do have sympathy for her because similar to like the kids now who come up through Nickelodeon, they're trained in such a specific wow winky to the camera and she was not just machine at making movies as a child in this very particular style. She was applauded for it and recognized for it and told this is the best way to do this. I don't think she would have ever had the chance to branch out of that without a really strong director and a role and movie tone that was very, very different than what she had done before because some of it hues a little too closely. There's melodramatic crying from all of the women in this. Truly, the first five minutes of this movie has this very heavy voiceover. Claudette Colbert is <laughs> looking at this empty bed. I just was like, oh no, this is going to be horrifying. So I feel like there were clues that Shirley could have been picking up on. Like, yes, everyone else is also doing heaving crying scenes. I'm spot on. Limited is a very nice word for it. And then you also have Claudette Colbert, another actress whose appeal I just don't seem to get. She's good. She's very good in this. But she had become the mother figure of World War II. She didn't want to play a mother to a teenager in this movie, but Selznick sold her on it as it was patriotic. She needed to do it for her country. And she also made a lot of money. <laughs> and I just rewatched So Proudly We Hail a couple weeks sure. ago. Which that was is, right before this, wasn't it? Right. I think that was 40, 43, where she plays the mother to a group of nurses. And it's very similar to this movie in that they're both matronly type of roles. She's solid. She's solid. And I think being a dependable person is a very hard role because you don't really stand out. I think you, Kristen, are crazy. <laughs> I say that with absolute respect. But there's the thing, I think some actors, they're flavors for people, so you're either into their flavor or you're not. Right. But Claudette Colbert in this, to me, was just luminescent, and I'm not only referring to the beautiful cinematography that we already mentioned. There were so many times when I was watching this where she is so present in the scene, she's reacting to everything, because you're saying she's the fulcrum 
of this movie. She's the character almost everybody else bounces off of, and she is immediate in her responses to them. She always has this gentle laugh ready to go, which I found, oh, what a smart way to make this character light and sympathetic in such dark times. But it felt true. I felt that she was a light, loving woman who happened to be in this America that was in the middle of war and had just sent her husband off and was trying her best. But I always felt how she approached things was with a very authentic lightness. And I felt that that was so welcome and it was completely because of what Claudette was putting out as a performer. I am totally willing to be wrong on this. (laughs) (laughs) And I say this about certain actors, you know, maybe I just haven't seen the film that will get me. Although I do love her in It Happened One Night. I think she's... Well, you know, yeah, you already know that's one of my all-time favorites. Like I said, maybe the flavor. I saw her in that and will always have a soft spot. But I also find her career in general, I don't know who her modern contemporary would be. She did such a range. Going back from comedies to dramas like she did, back and forth, is not a normal thing, especially in the star-making Hollywood, they wanted a person's name and face to represent a very specific tone, but she was on both sides of it, and then also had musical chops. I don't know, whoever goes from It Happened One Night to Cleopatra, it's insane. (laughs) She's definitely whatever the female equivalent is of a jack-of-all-trades. I hate that we don't have enough plural words for... I know! Genders. Well, we should mention very briefly, before we get to my last question, this did win an Oscar for Max Steiner's score, which I think is is beautiful. It was nominated in Picture, Lead Actress for Claudette Colbert, Supporting Actor for Monty Woolley, Supporting Actress for Jennifer Jones, Cinematography, Art Direction, Editing, and Effects. I'm not understanding what effects were nominated, because I don't know of any effects that happened in this movie other than maybe Agnes Moorhead's hat. Um, (laughs) Did they refer to effects then as both practical and on screen because they did have the triage moments with soldiers that could be it that Um, would make the most sense to me some of these winners in case you were curious the movie got shut out by going my way which was the bing crosby movie this was nominated for best picture alongside that double indemnity gaslight and wilson Oh, what a year. I know, and Going My Way is the one that wins. Which it's I always that. <laughs> exactly, I guarantee you nobody's going to remember. I'm sure somebody's going to send me an email. Going My Way is a great movie and you haven't seen it. Monty Woolley was nominated alongside Claude Rains, Hume Cronin, Clifton Webb for Laura, and Barry Fitzgerald won for Going My Way in a bit of category fraud that they ended up changing after the awards. You could not be nominated for lead and supporting actor for the same role. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was yeah. nominated for the same performance. Claudette Colbert was also nominated in a year that included Greer Garson, Betty Davis, Barbara Stanwyck, and Ingrid Bergman won for Gaslight. I mean, that's just a murderer's row. That's... I know, I can't complain, I can't complain that about that. Not... <laughs> and in case everybody wanted to know what Jennifer Jones, who she was nominated alongside, Eileen McMahon, Angela Lansbury, Agnes Moorhead, her co-star, but it's not for this movie, she was nominated for Mrs. Parkington, and Ethel Barrymore won for None But the Lonely Heart, which I'm guessing they gave that to Ethel as like a decades of work. Yeah, that's your Sylvester Stallone getting it for Creed 2. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Overall, though, do you feel music is about what it should have won for? Would you argue that it should have won something else? Yeah, who won for cinematography? So cinematography was switched into black and white, and apparently they had absolutely no limit because we have two, four, six, eight, ten nominees for black and white cinematography in 1945. So Since You Went Away was nominated alongside 30 Seconds Over Tokyo, the White Cliffs of Dover, The Uninvited, Lifeboat, Going My Way, Dragon Seed. Dragon Seed, in case you're curious, is a movie where Katherine Hepburn plays an Asian woman. Oh, yes, my. Double Indemnity, and the winner was Joseph Lachelle for Laura. Oh. Which I can't complain. I, mean, I can't complain about that yeah, one. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm with, I'll back that up. I'm glad it made the cut, although it sounds like most of them did. 
30 Seconds to Tokyo, of course, being the kind of war film that goes like a whole different direction when it comes to propaganda. Keep in mind that this was also the year where they felt Cover Girl, Lady in the Dark, and Meet Me in St. Louis did not have great color cinematography worth giving an Oscar to. They were nominated, but the winner was Wilson. Let you guys all remember Wilson. Oh, one of my favorite movies. <laughs> it's called uh, Wilson. <laughs> so let's end this with asking the question, do we like that the movie does not end with Father coming home? Father does not come home at the end of this movie. Father is missing in action, and then we find out at the 11th hour that he's not missing in action. He's been found. But the movie does not end with him going like Little Women where he comes back through the door frame and you know, I, I was waiting for that. I was yeah. like, he's going to come in now. No, no, no. Oh, that's coming. funny. I really appreciated the perfect bookend of keeping it all about the women in the house that we never see him at the beginning other than in photo on the drawer and that we don't see him again returning. We don't see him leave either. I liked the symmetry of that. It was always about these women and their responses to his absence, rather than having a man come in at the last minute and usurp, like, everything now towards me. Please put your emotions in this general direction. It was also a beautiful final shot of, it is the melodramatic her, children, I've heard, father's coming home. And she's like running up the stairs. There's a beautiful shot out the window and it, we leave them in their house and we know things are going to be hopefully moving towards the better. I thought it was a lovely ending. I do like the ending a lot. I, and I like that it didn't go for what I expected. It keeps you on your toes. That being said, when she goes to wake everybody up, I was thinking, God, wouldn't it be great if, you know, they live next door to the Meet Me in St. Louis house where the dad was also waking <laughs> everybody up to tell them? And you know, this is just one of those movies, apparently in the you know mid-40s, you just could not get a decent night's sleep. No. Everybody was waking you up. So overall, do you recommend people watch this? What are your overall thoughts about Since You Went Away? You know what? I would recommend it. I think that in terms of a moment of time and something that really gives a lot of good feminine perspective on this and both at different stages of life, I really liked this. And I think we both agree it moves much faster than its running time. And the parts that linger are giving me a nice shade of what's around them in their community and in their world. I didn't resent them for those departures. I quite liked this and would definitely pass it along. I'd even watch it again with someone. I am so fortunate Kino put this out on a very beautiful Blu-ray last year and I have that and I finally got to watch it. I finally got to take it out of the packaging, which oh. I'm very happy about. So if you have not watched it, I definitely recommend it. Yeah, don't be intimidated by the runtime because it moves very briskly. It's got practically every famous star you want to see yeah. in that time period. It's worth watching. I think Robert Walker, to bring it back to our birthday boy, is very, very good in his portrayal of a, a different type of character that we, they probably didn't see, you know, or made fun of in 1944, but we understand and we applaud in 2018. Although it is very hard to separate what was going on behind the scenes from what is presented on screen. And if anything, hopefully this will remind you that Jennifer Jones was a good actress and she was stuck in a bad set of circumstances and we should stop giving her crap for that. <laughs> I have to defend this every time I talk about her. <laughs> there are worse things to defend. Exactly. Well, listeners, let me know your thoughts on Since You Went Away, Robert Walker. Tell me that Jennifer Jones is an awful human being. I don't care. <laughs> you can email them to me at ticklishbiz at gmail.com and I'll read them on the next episode. I'd like to thank Drea Clark once again for joining me today. Drea, where can fans find, get in touch with you, see your work, all of that? DreaClark.com has the list of the films that I've made and the festivals I work with. And you can find me on Twitter at the Drea Clark. So before I close things out, I wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping because now that the show is finally back on track with my nifty new computer, I can actually devote a lot more time to the show than I was was prior to working on an older computer that was harder to edit. I did mention on Twitter, if you are following the Ticklish Business Twitter feed, that I am introducing a couple new members of the Ticklish Business crew. Now, right now it's just been me and my fabulous editor, Amber Cortez, who is so gracious to edit this podcast for me, but we are also taking on a couple of co-hosts, and these are not co-hosts that are on the Patreon, although 
those are uh, fantastic co-hosts, William Bibiani and Adam Kautzer, and I'll touch on uh, the episodes that I've been recording with them in a second. But I am actually bringing on two co-hosts for the show right now that you will be hearing from regularly. That is Samantha Ellis and who you just heard right now, Drea Clark. They are both going to be on the show semi-regularly. I'm going to alternate both of them throughout the month. They'll probably be on together a couple episodes as well with me throughout the year. That's not to say that I'm not going to have some great guests, other guests that were not going to be the two ladies that I just mentioned, but they are going to be the regular Ticklish Business co-hosts. So please welcome them. I will be including all their contact information in the show notes if you'd like to start following them. So I'm so excited to bring them both on and uh, just talk to them about classic films. These are two girls that really know their stuff. So I hope you guys enjoy them as much as I, I do, which I would not be bringing them on the show regularly if I did not think they were awesome. So as always, uh, this is going to close out Ticklish Business for this episode. You can contact Ticklish Business and listen a variety of different ways, either directly at ticklishbusiness.podbean.com, via Stitcher Radio and Player FM, or Spotify. It looks like most of you guys are listening on Spotify. Thank you. Or on iTunes. If you are listening via iTunes, please consider helping the podcast out by leaving a rating or review. As always, you can contact me directly at ticklishbiz, that's B-I-Z, gmail.com, or visit me at my official website where I discuss classic films semi-regularly, journeysinclassicfilm.com. The podcast is also on Twitter at ticklish underscore biz, so if you want to get up-to-the-minute info on what's going on, definitely follow. Want to learn more about upcoming episodes or hear exclusive content before anyone else? Then consider supporting Ticklish Business via Patreon. I have a wealth of amazing perks. All your donations go right back into making Ticklish Business the premier classic film podcast that it is. If you become a patron right now, you can actually listen to two, count them two, bonus episodes. I am doing supplemental podcasts monthly on the Patreon for Patreon subscribers. So you will get a double dose, sometimes a triple dose of me. You can listen to the pilot episodes right now. The first one is William Bibiani and I looking at how Hollywood talks about itself in cinema with the show based on a true podcast. Our first episode talks about the 1999 Orson Welles biopic RKO 281, and we're actually prepping to release the next episode looking at the murder of George Reeves and the biopic Hollywoodland. So we're going to get a little true crime in there with our biopic. And if you want to hear even more of me talking about movies, you can hear Adam Kautzer and I talking about the 1958 and 1988 versions of The Blob on another new show I started called Doubled Features, which is a supplemental show where we look at the features Hollywood just wants to remake again and again. We're going to be talking about The Blob in the first episode. We're going to be looking at The Bad Seed in September in honor of Lifetime remaking it. So it's a very, very fun show. Both of them are great. So if you want to hear some different stuff from me and the other hosts, definitely consider subscribing and getting some free content. You can also check out my interviews on Patreon with Alan K. Rohde, TCM Tour Guide, Sarah Louise, Louise, Lily, and more. If you're interested in becoming a patron, just head over to patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. And if you want to learn more about the stars turning 100 this year and you're a member of TCM's exclusive fan club, TCM Backlot, you can read my year-long series, Centennial Celebration, about the stars spotlighted here. I talk about films and share information that you won't hear on the show. Next time, Sarah Louise Lilly, the TCM tour guide that I just talked about, who's on my Patreon page if you want to hear our interview, is actually going to join me again to talk about a movie. We are going to honor Marilyn Monroe and look at 1953's How to Marry a Millionaire. Till next time. Bye.